The Constitution is an important document. It's essential to this unique purpose. But the purpose is never really stated. Human beings, like other organisms, uh, are built to compete on the basis of their genetic relatedness. The United States is first and foremost a grouping of people who are not related closely to each other. And the Constitution is a document designed to stabilize that strategy. All of the, the content of the Constitution is built to take the conflicts of interest and other things that would tend to make an attempt to group people who are not genetically related to each other um, it is a, an attempt to make those structures stable. So that is to say that under normal circumstances, evolution has one group competing against another based on who is closely related to whom. In the United States, an attempt was made to do something else, and that was to take the idea of reciprocity, which is itself an evolutionary concept, and to make it structurally sound such that we could continue on indefinitely profiting not so much from collaborating with those who are closely related to us, but collaborating with those who have a shared interest. All right, so let's take what Brett has said here piece by piece. There's three main things that he said that I disagree with. Number one, humans are built to compete on the basis of genetic relatedness. I would say this is true for animals. Animals are built to compete on the basis of genetic relatedness. Humans have evolved to cooperate, and he mentions it later, he calls it reciprocity. And humans have evolved to have an extreme level of reciprocity. I guess Brett might say that the reciprocity is only between those who are genetically related, but in humans, we have reciprocity in uh, between pe members of our own species. So sure, we might have um, we might give a little bit of extra energy towards cooperating with immediate family members versus someone from another clan. But if they're human, we're going to reciprocate with them. And um, I'm not sure what kind of competition he's talking about, but for the most part, humans have evolved out of competition. So humans, humans claim to fame is cooperation. Of course, all mammals have cooperation in the form of raising their children. Reptiles, for the most part, don't raise their children, so they compete against their children. The reptiles will just assume eat their children for lunch and not think twice about it, won't even realize they're eating their kids. A mammal puts lots of energy into raising their children. Humans take that to a level far above and beyond what the average mammal does. And there's actually spiritual components to it. There's a spiritual bonding that happens between clanmates. And the spiritual bonding is, as far as I can tell, not genetic, but it is developed after birth when exposed to a virtual environment of the human mind. So when a child is exposed to mature members of the human species who have a robust spiritual bonding with fellow humans, the child's brain mimics that and learns how to do that. It becomes imprinted in a way on their brain as they develop. However, when there's an absence of mature humans around the child, when there's an absence of spiritual bonding in the adult humans around the child, then the child does not learn that skill. And the virtual environment that's created in the mind of the, the child as it grows up is less sophisticated. It's more equal with that of animals, which is just a base level of sight and sound and smell compiled by the brain into a consciousness that perceives a movie of the physical world in its head. Humans ha go way above and beyond the basic virtual world of animals by having this spiritual sense. Um, we can um, hallucinate visions of, of God and angels. We can communicate with our dead relatives. This is why for hundreds of thousands of years we've buried our dead and had ceremonies. When people die, uh, we decorate their graves and so forth. 
because we have this spiritual, we've developed the spiritual sense that there's an afterlife and that we can communicate with them and we can sense them after they, they're dead. We have the bond, the spiritual bond with our fellow humans is so strong that we've developed the ability to continue that bond after they die. Animals don't have this. So clearly humans have developed the ability to expand their virtual reality in their mind far above and beyond what, what animals can do. And part of the reason we've developed this is that when you're spiritually bonded to your fellow humans, you're more likely to cooperate. And so the evolutionary reason for allowing this to happen or for perpetuating this is that it's good for survival because when you cooperate, you're more likely to survive. When you compete, you're more likely to lose the competition at some point, and you're not going to survive. It's like the old metaphor of one twig can be broken easily, and you get 20 twigs together in a bundle, and it's really hard to break them. So together, we're stronger. And there's no reason to think that, well, I guess there are reasons, but the, the method by which it's not genetic. It's not inborn genetic. We're not born with this. We're born with a brain that's not developed. And we know that when children have been raised by wolves, there's been rare instances where children have been lost in the, the wild and they've been taken up by a pack of wolves and the wolves raise the child. And then five years later, they're alive living with wolves and we find them and we rescue them. And these children grow up and they have brain damage. They have developmental brain damage such that they do not know how to bond with humans. They can't walk upright. They crawl on all fours. They actually have heightened sense of smell. They can smell meat from hundreds of yards away and they can go find meat. And they can't speak, of course. Um, they're able to learn after they're rescued maybe a vocabulary of 10 to 20 words at most, but they, they're never able to develop traits that we consider to be human because they lost that window. And so this shows that it's not genetic. A lot of what makes us human is not genetic, but it is, uh, for lack of better words, cultural. So it's developmental. We have the genetic potential as humans, and then we have to stimulate these genes within a certain window by having a specific environment. And there's the physical environment that's needed. Then there's the virtual environment. We need to have humans who are living in a virtual reality in their minds. And the cues through body language and mannerisms from the humans around the child who's developing, these physical body cues, um, the sound of our voice and so forth, signal the child to learn how to develop that virtual reality inside their own mind. They develop the capacity to see into and live within this virtual reality that humans have developed above and beyond what animals do, which is to not only see and hear and smell and compile that into a coherent three-dimensional picture in their head of of the physical world, but also a spiritual sense that does not exist in the physical world. And this is part of how humans bond so strongly with each other, how they could possibly raise a child for 12 to 20 years, how they could stay with family members and not fight with them and not compete with them because the spiritual bonding is such that it's the idea of oneness. When you study the different religious Traditions of around the world, especially the mystical parts of those traditions, the unifying theme for a lot of them is this feeling of oneness, that when we love others, we are loving ourselves. When we love ourselves, we are loving others. And so this is a spiritual sense that when I look into your eyes as a fellow human, I see myself. And so there's this virtual reality that other humans are me. And so therefore I want to cooperate with them because they're me. So, so it's like, it's a way that we have developed a way around our base evolution as being an animal. And he's right that we compete with each other for survival, but we've developed a way around this, which is when I, it's a spiritual sense that when I look into your eyes, I see myself, therefore, I cooperate with you because you are me. So we actually unify our base animal instincts with the capacity to cooperate with others for our own benefit. 
because others are us. There's this illusion that other people are the same as us, that we are them. And so as a unit, the group now competes with those who are not in the group. And so maybe that's what Brett Weinstein means when he says that humans are built to compete on a basis of genetic relatedness, that we only cooperate with those who are in our group, and then we compete with those who are outside of our group. And that's exactly what's happening today in Western societies like America. But that's not what humans were designed to do. We were designed to look into the eyes of other humans and see ourselves. And so I would say that the degree to which humans are refusing to see themselves in the eyes of others is the degree to which they were not exposed to the proper physical environment or the proper virtual environment that was required for them to fully develop into a fully healthy human. And so to say humans are built to compete on the basis of genetic relatedness is actually not true. Animals are, are built on that basis. But humans actually, for 200,000 years, we've been fully human in the African savannas. And we had a, a spiritual sense. We know this because the fossil record shows that humans were burying their dead and having um, decorating the graves of their dead about 200,000 years ago. So at that point, we know we had the spiritual sense. And so until we left Africa and started farming, uh, we, we left Africa maybe 50 to 80,000 years ago, depending on who you ask, and we started farming only about 12,000 years ago. So for around 200,000 years, maybe 180,000 years ago, well, for 180,000 of the last 200,000 years, we have been fully human, not only genetically, but socially, culturally human, meaning we've developed the spiritual sense that when I look into your eyes, I see myself. And so that is what human is. So if you go back a little further before we had the spiritual sense, we may have been genetically human, but we, we hadn't fully developed into what I would consider as human, which is to have a strong spiritual sense. And then millions of years before that, our ape ancestors didn't have language. So of course they weren't human. They were human ancestors, but they weren't human. And so we have to define what we're talking about. When we say that humans are built to compete on a basis of genetic relatedness, it's just not true. It's just not true. I guess technically it's true because we are competing, but we're not competing with humans. We are built to compete with other animals. We're built to compete with plants, but we are not built to compete with other humans because we have a spiritual sense. We're supposed to have a spiritual sense that allows us to see others as ourself. And so as far as I can tell from the anthropological studies of native tribes, they did not compete with each other prior to farming. They were cooperative. If they competed, it was in very mild um, ways. And it wasn't, it, I wouldn't call it competing. It might just be that you gave slightly more energy to your own clan than to a neighboring clan. So if you want to call that competing, fine. But if a neighboring clan or a member of a neighboring clan came to your clan and needed help, you would help them because you would look into their eyes and that you, you would see that you were them. And so they would be part of the human, they would be part of you. Okay, that's, that's enough on the first part. The second part, he says, the U.S. is a group of people who are not related closely to each other. So <clears throat> obviously from what I've said on the first part, you can see that everyone in America is human. We are one species of human. And so I guess he's trying to say that because I guess he's trying to say we're only related to uh, what is it? Your, our first cousins, our second cousins? Brett, where do you draw the line of where we are related and where we're not? Is it fifth cousins? And then what about adoption? When you adopt someone into your family, they're not, according to you, they're not genetically related, 
but still you're going to cooperate with them. You're not going to compete with them, right? What about a neighbor who you have, you play soccer with in the league? You're not going to compete with them, right? Um, but they're not related. So I'm not sure what you're talking about, that the U.S. is a group of people who are not closely um, related to each other and that therefore, in your first statement, that we are genetically built to compete with them. That just is observationally false, that there's a lot of examples of humans cooperating with other humans that are, according to you, distantly related, very distantly or unrelated, let's say. So how can that be? Is that because of the Constitution? Like, is that because we created a nation? Is that, is that the only reason that unrelated people can cooperate is because of the Constitution or the, the national identity? We have the same national identity. What about my neighbor, actually, who is an immigrant from Spain, has a green card and has a job here? He's not part of my nation, yet I cooperate with him. You know, he's a... He's, He's not a close friend, but I certainly am not competing with him. So if we were genetically built to compete on the basis of genetic relatedness, then it just doesn't make sense that we would be so readily willing and able to comp to cooperate with people who are, according to you, not related to us. So I would say that one way, if, if the first statement is true, let's say I'm wrong, the first statement is true, then the way around it is that your second statement is false, that we were built, okay, fine, we were built to compete on genetic relatedness. However, we were built to compete with those who are not our same species. And so it doesn't matter that the people in America are not related to me as far as a brother, sister, or cousin, but they are the same species. Therefore, I'm not built to compete with them. Therefore, we don't need a constitution or a national identity in order to achieve cooperation. Now, I agree with you completely that there is a huge problem of humans in America not cooperating. That is the problem in our country, hands down. It actually doesn't matter if we have a communist system, a fascist system, a democratic system, a socialist system a libertarian system, an anarchy system. It doesn't matter what the system is of our governance of our nation. If one thing were true, if everyone had a strong urge to cooperate with all other humans that they come in contact with or whom, whom they have some interaction with, including online, then it wouldn't matter what the system of our nation was because the problem is a lack of cooperation between humans. If we had a strong sense of cooperation within each of us, all of our problems would quickly go away. Now, that's not to say that we would end all suffering immediately, but we would quickly march towards eliminating major forms of suffering and any inequalities that are contributing to that suffering. So I agree with you big time on that. Number three, you say that reciprocity, which is itself an evolutionary concept with those who have a shared interest. I would say that, again, that is the human claim to fame, reciprocity um, within the human species. And again, that's based on the spiritual sense that we've developed. And when we look into the eyes of another human, we see ourselves. Unfortunately, this is why we don't cooperate. It's because so many of us have not developed the drive to cooperate because we have not developed the spiritual sense to the level which is required in order to see ourselves in the eyes of other humans. And so the question then remains not who do we elect to office, what form of government do we construct because it doesn't matter that can't and won't fix the problem of a lack of spiritual sense, a lack of the ability to see, a, see yourself in the eyes of others, the lack of the drive to cooperate. It just won't fix that. I'm sure some systems might help more than others, but as you say that it's not, you even are saying that it takes more than just ideas and the ideas are really secondary, that it's really the type of person who you elect, namely you're calling this type of person a patriot. And I'm not sure what you mean by that, 
but my sense is that what you mean is someone whose brain is working, who has the spiritual sense that everyone is equal and has a strong drive to cooperate and therefore can model that brainwave pattern, that body language, that compassion in their tone of voice, and therefore can bring people together to model for them how to cooperate. So you're right on with that. However, the reason I'm making this video is that if you honestly believe that humans were genetically created to compete with each other, except for your immediate family, again, I don't know where you draw the line of genetic relatedness, then that implies that human nature is competition, which implies that we have to fix human nature. We have to change human nature. We have to, and in a very scary scenario that you said is the only, the only way, by having an entity called the government have a monopoly on force, on violence, have a monopoly on violence as a background threat to shape people towards the ideal of cooperation, that will never work. It is the antithesis of what humans have evolved to become. It's called coercion. Humans are averse to coercion. Humans are disgusted by coercion. Coercion is the opposite of cooperation. Don't you see that you cannot foster cooperation through the use of coercion? <laughs> if you think that's true, then you're lost because you don't really understand human evolution or human development. Humans have evolved and they develop by mimicking the brainwave patterns of their elders who are raising them through their facial expressions and body languages and their tone of voice. So if your elders, as you're being raised, have a tone of voice and facial expressions of coercion, of threatening you with violence or force in order for you to do what they say, which is to cooperate, you will never succeed because the way humans develop is they mimic, they mimic. So the only way to develop humans to have cooperation be second nature, so to speak, is by raising them, surrounding them with people who cooperate and by having a system which is defined by cooperation, not coercion, not of a monopoly on violence. The only way that the government having a monopoly on violence would work is if that monopoly on violence was never exercised or even used as a threat. So in other words, only the government can be violent, and then the government says, we will never be violent. So in other words, if the government could eradicate violence, including its own use of violence, then a monopoly on force by the government would work. But why even call it that? And that's not possible, because if you need violence to coerce people to do the right thing, that means those people have brain damage because they did not develop growing up to learn to cooperate with others because they did not develop the spiritual sense of looking in someone's eyes and realizing that that person is also me. I realize that what I'm saying might make it sound like it's impossible to fix the human condition that we currently find ourselves in, but we're never going to fix it ever if we take Brett Weinstein's approach and, by the way, Jordan Peterson's approach, which he's repeated multiple times in his videos that humans are, well, I don't remember his exact words, but humans by nature are bad or violent or evil, something of this sort, and that we, the only way to not act out these bad things is for us to 
stand up straight and keep our room clean and and be vigilant about our internal states so that we can take our dangerousness and make sure we use it for good. So I'm not saying that his approach is wrong. It's just that his presupposition is wrong. Humans are not bad at the core, but modern brain-damaged humans are. So we need to realize that modern humans have developmental brain damage because they lack the full spiritual sense that we had for 200,000 years that made us peaceful and naturally cooperative. And that's why we are competing and why we're violent. Violence is not in human nature. So by identifying the actual underlying cause of the problem, there's actually a slight chance now that we could fix it going along with Jordan Peterson and Brett Weinstein's theory that evolution made us bad people and we just have to hack ourselves into being good, it's never going to work because it's not the problem and it's not, tr it's not true and it means you don't understand how to create a human who is naturally cooperative and nonviolent. You don't know how humans have naturally evolved so you you can't figure out the problem now in this video I have not discussed why are humans this way now why have we lost this ability to see ourselves in the eyes of others and so that's the the next question right we have to answer that question accurately before we can remedy the problem it's still close to impossible but there's at least a slight chance if we can answer that question and I don't know that I'm smart enough to to know the answer to that, I think I've got pretty close and I'll go over it in, a, in another video. But I know that I'm definitely not smart enough once if I'm right about why we lost this ability, I don't think I'm smart enough to figure out what to do about it. I just know that it's possible now that we know what true human nature is, why we lost it. Now it's possible knowing these two things that we could figure out what to do about it to regain our natural human cooperativeness and spiritual sense. I need help with that, but no one can help me until you understand that everybody's getting wrong the diagnosis of what the problem is. We have to come to a consensus on what the problem is, why it happened, and then we could work as a team to figure out what to do about it. So intuitively, Brett is on the right track that we need somebody to lead us as a figurehead who has a more functional brain, who is inclined to be cooperative and who can model cooperation. So intuitively he knows that's what we need. We don't need necessarily more ideas, better ideas. We don't need better laws, more regulations, less regulations. We need someone to model cooperation to us because that's what we missed when we were growing up. We didn't have enough cooperation, enough people modeling cooperation, enough people modeling spiritual sense to us for us to develop those traits, those classically human traits. And I'm not sure that it can be fixed. It's like when you are a child, if you grow up in China learning Chinese as your language, there's certain sounds in China in Chinese that Americans can't make. It's very difficult for them to make these sounds. And it turns out that there's a window of time when you're a child that your brain can learn sounds in language sounds. And so because we never hear these sounds, we never develop the ability to speak them. And likewise, people in China who don't hear certain English sounds that are only in the English language I shouldn't say only, but who, which are not in the Chinese language, they end up not after a certain window of time. If they don't hear those sounds, they're, they have a really hard time being able to say those sounds. And so hopefully it's not like that with the spiritual sense and the cooperation. If it is, then we're still not fully hopeless because we could at least fake it to some degree. And 
until we can figure out a way to raise children in such a way that they get their cooperation and spiritual sense genetics turned on and they can be closer to normal than we are and then they can grow up and take the baton and continue on and perhaps after five or six generations of doing this we could get back to normal or at least close enough such that we have enough cooperative instinct that we are capable of ending human suffering as we know it.